meritocracy. After all, my parents, by almost anyone's definition, achieved the American dream. My father literally came here to America completely on his own, not speaking a word of English, with $30 and the clothes on his back. My mom spent six months at a refugee camp in Malaysia, having fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. They met serendipitously in Northwest Indiana. Neither of them have had the privilege to attend school past the sixth grade. Fast forward a couple of decades, and they own their own home and a successful restaurant in the Chicago suburbs. My brother and I helped out while maintaining good grades and participating in a host of extracurricular activities. We grew up believing that hard work, humility, making smart decisions, and a little bit of luck could go a long way in bringing your dreams to life. I coasted through my elementary, junior high, and high school years, thanks to youth, naivete, and a decent level of book smarts. It never occurred to me once that my goals, whether personal or professional, were ever limited or different in any way due to my gender. I was a cheerleader who was also three years ahead of me. In elementary school, I rode the bus to the junior high to take pre-algebra in the fifth grade, and from the junior high to the high school to take honors geometry in the eighth grade. All the other students on the bus were boys, but I didn't think very much of it. I wasn't even rattled when I actually failed honors geometry in eighth grade. A big fat F on my report card. True story. Spoiler alert, I turned out okay. My well-intentioned mother, having never studied math past elementary school, said to me, maybe boys are just naturally better at math. I shrugged it off, assuming I'd just do better next time. Like my dad always said, work hard, stay humble, make good decisions. It didn't even faze me, really, that the AP physics class consisted of almost all boys, even when casually sexist jokes were made. I was friends with most of the boys in that class, and I didn't think they could possibly mean harm by suggesting that girls just couldn't hang in the hard science. Looking back, I now realize that my blissful ignorance and youthful naivete blinded me to implicit biases. I now know that children are socialized differently based on gender, and with regard to the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, from basically infancy. A study I conducted while completing my PhD in Cognitive and Developmental Psychology at UCLA looked at the ways American mothers talk to their young children. It found that when American mothers talk to their children, they talk about numbers and quantities two to three times more often to boys compared to girls. In this study, we looked at children on average at age 22 months, just under two years old, an age where kids aren't even really counting on their own yet. When I did the literature review for this study, I learned that these early biased behaviors are just one way that implicit bias affects human behavior throughout the lifespan. For example, boys get more encouragement in math from both parents and teachers, and mothers tend to overestimate boys' abilities compared to girls. In a study that took place in a science museum, researchers found that when parents talk about exhibits, they explain scientific concepts three times more often to boys. And not to mention, just how gender-specific toys, television shows, and other media are. Companies like Goldilocks are campaigning against gender-specific toys, particularly those that focus on STEM skills, like building and spatial reasoning, which are far more often marketed to boys than girls. From elementary school through high school, the gender gap in the STEM fields grows more and more pronounced. By the spring of kindergarten, boys already show a greater willingness to learn math concepts. And by third grade, girls rate their competence as significantly lower than their male classmates, despite no evidence of actual differences in mathematical performance. It might not surprise you then that if girls are already not expecting to succeed as early as elementary school, that by college, their interests have shifted to fields in which they feel more confident. Indeed, only 18% of American computer science college majors are women, a number that's been declining over the past 30 years. And when it comes to tenure-track faculty in mathematics, only 17% are female, with a paltry 11% in engineering. But despite these vast gender differences in the pursuit of STEM careers, it is important to note yet again that no measure of standardized math performance shows a gender difference between kindergarten all the way through college. 
Before embarking on my Silicon Valley technology career about four and a half years ago, I followed the career path of a typical young scientist. Throughout graduate school, I still believed in the power of hard work, humility, and perseverance. But it was well into adulthood before I realized that my view of a meritocracy did not exactly represent the real world. My teaching evaluations glossed over my command of the material and the classroom and focused more on my appearance or what I was wearing. One of my postdoctoral advisors told me that back in the day, female professors needed to be bitches to succeed, but women of my generation could be a little more feminine, or in his words, enjoy being a girl. To this day, I have no idea what that means, and even less of an idea of how that relates to one's scholarly achievements. Once a colleague, when I told her that I had a lunch meeting with an esteemed male professor at a partner university, said that I could get in good with it by wearing a low-cut shirt. And yet another advisor, when I told her I was considering careers outside academia, asked if I was leaving because of a boyfriend, as if the decision could not have been for any other reason. With no knowledge of the situation and no clinical training, she suggested I get a prescription for antidepressants. Although my view of academia as one of the world's last standing meritocracies was beginning to fade, Silicon Valley still looked bright and shiny. To an outsider, it was a world where it didn't matter what you looked like or where you came from. It was a place where hard work and skill paid off, sometimes to the tune of millions or even billions of dollars. The new American dream was now the tech startup. I was thrilled when I got a job at a buzzed about startup founded by an even more buzzed about young founder. All I wanted to do was surround myself with intelligent, like-minded people who were dedicated to a cause. In this case, we wanted to improve education for kids all around the world. But very quickly I learned, while hard work prevailed, humility did not. <laughs> Egos and greed hastened this particular startup's failure within six months of my arrival. But I had just moved across the country and given up my entire academic career. And I had to keep going. Keeping in mind what my dad always taught me about hard work and humility, I went back on the job market and I struggled for a while. Until I got a job at another well-regarded early stage startup. This time, the CEO was experienced. He had sold his previous company and worked at well-established, respected tech companies. And he believed in gender equity. He wanted his employees to know that the policies of his company were flexible, open, and family-friendly. For example, young mothers could take time off, and the door would be open for them to come back whenever they were ready. I had found my dream job, and I couldn't wait to get to work. Within a couple of months, it was evident that while the CEO paid lip service to equality and diversity, it was much harder in practice to build a culture of respect and empathy. While interviewing candidates to fill the role of lead designer, my female colleague and I raised concerns that one gentleman showed signs of being difficult to work with. Even after raising these concerns more than once, the person in question was hired. He was impossible to work with. He even threw his laptop across the room in one of his more animated outbursts. The company culture became chaotic, communication broke down quickly, people pulled rank, and egos started doing the talking. I raised concerns that I was not being respected or listened to. My boss told me that it was my fault. I was too emotional, he said. I was loud, abrasive, hysterical. He defended the laptop thrower and told me that I was the one who needed to watch my tone and rein in my behavior. I was heartbroken to hear these words. Of course I was emotional. My dream job had become a nightmare and a hellish place to work. In trying to get a word in edgewise in contentious conversations, I had been labeled difficult. But if I said nothing, I would be called weak. There was no win in this situation. When I asked how to better navigate such scenarios, I was told that's just how designers are. I'd have to suck it up, be less emotional. Be more silent, I suppose. Around the time I started my job, a report came out in Fortune magazine by a linguist who analyzed 248 performance reviews of people working in the tech industry. About 42% of the sample were women, which is a higher proportion than in the tech industry overall. Almost all reviews collected were positive, but Kieran Snyder, the author of the study, noticed a peculiar pattern. In critical reviews, Negative feedback was given to 88% of women, but only 59% of men. 
Moreover, the critical feedback differed between genders. Men were often given suggestions on the skills they should improve, while women's feedback included words like bossy, abrasive, emotional, and aggressive. The word abrasive alone was used 17 times to describe 13 women, but never once to describe a man. With women making up only about 30% of the technology workforce, with smaller and smaller numbers as we move up the chain of command, it is important to consider all the factors that have led us to an inequitable society. And so today I challenge all of you, young women and men alike, to be aware and think about the ways you can make a difference, however small, to change the culture. After all, it has been shown that teams that have more gender equality are more innovative and that nations with higher levels of girls and women's education produce greater economic output. Data show us time and time again that equality and diversity improve the lives of all of us, not just some of us. So how do you start? Be aware. Know that words do matter. Think about the ways bias and stereotypes affect the world we live in. And when you make a big decision in your life, whether it's which college to go to, what your first job is going to be, or anything of that nature, think about the types of people you'd like to surround yourself with and the environment you'd like to be in. Surround yourself with like-minded individuals and don't be afraid to speak up in the quest for positive change. Gender equity is just one of the many battles that we face in the quest for a more harmonious world. After a series of happy accidents, I have recently found myself in a job at a company that I love. My manager is respectful and supportive and the company's culture is one of inclusion. My company understands that its people are its greatest assets and that each employee's <laughs> personal and professional growth has a direct impact on its overall success. And even despite some of the more challenging times in my life, what my parents always taught me growing up remains true. Hard work, humility, smart decisions, and a little bit of luck do indeed go a long way. And with that, I wish you all the best in accomplishing your own American dream.